Um, hi, thanks. Uh, thanks again for Honest Bee for hosting us. So that's a uh, great theater today. Feels really cool. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Arseny Chernov. Um, I'm a practitioner. Um, I'm in technology for more than a decade. Uh, currently work for Standard Chatter Bank uh, in the cloud team there. So I'm here to do the introduction to Prometheus. This is going to be a broader um, meetup series about the modern infrastructure monitoring. Today we start with Prometheus as the most um, hot topic and uh, I will then pass the word to my colleagues from Cloudflare that would uh, uh, debunk the ways to go for um, thousands and hundreds um, and, and hundreds of uh, collocation and thousands of instances to get monitored by uh, Prometheus. Um, so it's really in, um, in a nutshell all about um, couple of guys that started Prometheus. So the story goes like, there was this uh, gentleman, his name is uh, Matt Proud, he's on uh, LinkedIn. He joined uh, SoundCloud uh, from Google after being uh, a software engineer in Google for over like five years. And he's, he's got a monitoring um, system open source project in mind that he wanted to develop. And it was like his uh, sole intention. And in Google, he was part of the um, uh, software development team on uh, LinkedIn, but in fact he was really closely wor working in some, um, some team that then formed what we know as SRE team, so Site Reliability Engineering Team. So um, another colleague of his from Google also joined um, uh, SoundCloud afterwards, and he's been in Google for two years, pretty much in the same uh, team with uh, Site Reliability and, and Charter. And uh, he contributed, he started, they, they caught up and he really started contributing to this uh, small open source site project. And then they uh, both merged their efforts and uh, done something that became like a Prometheus Alpha, or Prometheus Beta. It, would, it, would, it was not yet uh, on, um, live on uh, any of the repos, but uh, internally they started using it at SoundCloud. And then there was another um, committer, let's put it, uh, that uh, actually joined in uh, 2013 and he uh, also was an ex-Googler. So they have one big paradigm in mind and they wanted to make sure that public um, has um, all the principles of uh, successful infrastructure monitoring adopted in uh, Google available in... Uh Sorry, was it up? Yeah, can you Oh yeah, sure. Enjoy. No worries. Um, I thought it was a question. <laughs> I'm like, why would you ask questions at this stage? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, there was, these were the three guys that uh, formed, there were actually more of them, um, ex-Googlers and really savvy guys that formed the kind of like um, the beginning of uh, Prometheus. And everything they wanted to do is to deliver an open source project that would um, resemble what they've been doing uh, in-house at Google. And we'll talk about uh, what Google approach to monitoring large-scale distributed infrastructures um, is later on. Um, so basically, uh, major milestones after um, the early release, uh, uh, like internally in SoundCloud, uh, they rewrote the storage layer and uh, converted uh, the file system, uh, so converted the storage system to use the file system natively. So uh, use the chunking of uh, the time series and put it into the file system instead of relying on the particular database as a backend. Uh, first public release then followed in January 2015. Uh, in May 2016, uh, Prometheus joined the Cloud Native uh, Computing Foundation, and it's now a very um, close neighbor to Kubernetes out there in CNCF. Uh, Prometheus 2.0 was just announced, like literally a, a couple of weeks ago. It's uh, it received a lot of. Uh, 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 updates that were long due on the roadmap, uh, particularly, we'll, we'll talk about them and I, I hope the guys from Cloudflare would also chime in, particularly to the uh, storage of metrics and uh, also uh, uh, performance optimizations. And uh, today is our inaugural um, modern infrastructure monitoring meetup and we're starting with Prometheus, so that's also a milestone. So. Um, full story, I'll, I'll share in every slide, there will be a link if you, if you want to double click and then read the full story, um, just go for it. So the motivation behind it, as I've mentioned, was the best practices that uh, Google Site Reliability engineers um, were, um, were bound and uh, were, were really like de de developing um, in-house for many years and they brought it into the open source space with Prometheus. Um, First, what is SRE? There is this uh, book that uh, is available online, and uh, of course you can also uh, buy it if you want to print it or like in Kindle format. And uh, it covers a lot of aspects, uh, but the idea is if to, for a successful planet scale operations of the environment that is as complex as we know Google is, you have to have software engineers do operations. And um, they do the same work as the operation team, but they 
automate instead of uh, doing something manually. And there is this uh, notion of toil that they, uh, that they kind of introduced. And it's doing something once or maybe like two times manual is fine if there's a pager and some outage. But then going forward, they are, um, uh, they are bound to spend up to 50% on developing automation to avoid that manual labor intervention. So at any given time, over like a month or over a quarter, um, site reliability engineers are not able to um, uh, spend more than 50% of their um, of their like on shift uh, duties on doing some ops. Um, they really um, need to they, they really need to become like professional in automating what they've done manually and doing it at the global um, at the global infrastructure scale. Uh, and collecting indicators apparently is one of the very important. Uh, um, w one of the very important aspects of the job to understand what's not going, um, what's not working well, what's uh, uh, what's the type of error to predict the development of the situation. So uh, Prometheus is directly actually mentioned in this SRE book, and of course um, this the gentleman that uh, we talked about uh, previously. They done a lot of work for that. Um, so Google has um, those um, uh, uh, those internal notions. They they were actually. Uh, uh, developed in Google called SLIs, SLOs, and SLAs. Right now, we probably got used to them already, but um, I, I decided to just uh, uh, repeat them for um, for us. Uh, the uh, SLI is actually the metric. So you you're defining yes, just go ahead. Um, you're defining a particular uh, performance metric of a particular service in some uh, way. An example of an SLI would be a request latency or an error rate, for example, or a system throughput. And then uh, when you have the SLIs, uh, you can define an SLO, which would be your objective. Objective is not something that uh, is usually referred to as agreement. It's actually much um, uh, less strict. You have an upper bound, you have a lower bound, and basically it says that uh, this is where I predict my production environment should be to keep me happy. Um, the uh, SLA is actual contractual agreement, so it's uh, somewhere, uh, some way to guarantee and some way to pay um, and some way to rebate if you're not meeting a particular SLO. So it's usually um, uh, you even looser than SLO because uh, you don't want to go into the troubles and, uh, for example, over overcommit and under and under deliver. And um, one very uh, one very simple example would be like you're promising the SLA of uh, uh, 99.9, .9 and your SLO at the same time for a particular service is uh, 99.95. So that's um, presented in here. Like SLI would be an indicator of my HTTP status codes, and uh, my objective is to have less than 1% over HTTP 500s uh, rolling over 30 days. And then my agreement, uh, the business agreement, and the one that I'll be penalized if I breach, is 10% of monthly refund for every additional 0.1% uh, of uh, those error HTTP 500s. And then you may basically track it um, in, in a latency way. You may track it in throughput, but this is the idea. You set up an SLO. You have a target, and then you start tracking it quarter by quarter. And that's uh, the internal chargeback or direct user agreement that you publish on the website. Um, so now there are um, there are also four golden signals that uh, system um, um, that site reliability engineers uh, propose to monitor any given system. They say that if there is only these four that you can monitor, you'll be fine. Um, First of all is latency, because uh, latency is uh, the sen essential performance of your web app, so like what it takes to service a request. And also there is a good advice to um, track error latency, because slow errors, they are even more irritating for the users. So you really don't want to um, only focus on um, proper responses on 200s and their, and their OK latency, but you also want to see and track and be able to get awareness of the failures and how, how long it takes for user to actually see the um, see the error um, traffic so like how uh, how much uh, the system is loaded at a given time from the network and it depends on what type of system it could be for example a transaction per second metric if it's a database or some particular queue or it could be a throughput if it's a streaming or if it's a, a cache origin for example uh, just generally the errors how much uh, particular service is failing in terms of for example wrong content delivered so, and this could not be uh, simply measured. You need to have some probes. You need to do probably um, 
periodic checks like what's, what would be the uh, response to this particular uh, variable or what would, be, uh, uh, what would be the behavior behind it. But just errors not, uh, as like not just uh, web server errors, generally how, um, how are we dealing with a particular load and a particular set of parameters that go into the system. And um, saturation, so how um, usual metrics of CPU, um, how much load can I tolerate more? So what are we showing right, uh, right now? So uh, how much more in, in case my, my traffic is uh, ramping up, how much more can I uh, stand uh, about this infrastructure side when I need to stand up more services if needed? Um, and then once the SLOs are defined, uh, at Google, uh, the uh, notion of error budget is quite peculiar. So the idea behind it is it's okay to have some failures. And if you uh, withdraw the SLO from 100%, this is your um, error margin, so to say, to experiment, to actually uh, not, uh, not plan to have downtime, but uh, uh, plan to fail some experiments or maybe like try to push the release uh, train a little bit forward so that you could achieve... Uh, an earlier stage of your inf uh, of your service, uh, rather than delay to a particular change window. But once it's, once it's depleted, uh, you're no longer allowed to touch the infrastructure uh, before the next uh, kind of like counting cycle. So if you um, used all your budget, if for example you measure it week after week, so you have only that amount of outage that is allowed a week, um, you're no longer able to uh, push any more releases until the counter kind of resets for the next week or for the next uh, month. Um, and um, that way the uh, uh, DevOps team, the SREs and actual product uh, development teams, they are all aligned on the same set of targets. They all want to move forward with more releases, but at the same time they understand that infrastructure has some availability metrics to conform to. So if they are out of the budget, then they basically stop pushing it and wait for the reset. Um, so what Google does is they, um, they have uh, most of their applications exposing their uh, internal uh, metrics. So say, thinking about containers, for example, right? So uh, anything that is deployed in a, a Borg uh, scheduler, that is the internal scheduler that Google uses, exposes the metrics of that container into the built-in web server. So anything that runs in Google, any application, any microservice, uh, by default has the metrics exposed by um, something called var z. So it's a, a web server that runs a, a particular path called var z in um, um, uh, in the virtual host, and then you can pull it for all the metrics that are there, or uh, like basically get get depending on the server gets performance of uh, um, web or a particular database or KVS store anything. So they expose all their metrics. So what happens is they have a distributed set of systems that go and scrape these metrics, and um, architecturally uh, we'll see that uh, Prometheus is precisely the same. So uh, it's all about the polling interval. You go through a particular target system, get the metrics, and then you store it in the um, time series database. Uh, in Google, they are in TSDB, which is a blue unknown box uh, to the left-hand side on the picture. Uh, in Prometheus, there are multiple ways, but it just ends up as uh, a chunked uh, set of, um, um, a, a chunked, as chunked uh, time series that are scattered around the B tree on the file system of a regular um, instance. So traditional monitoring in uh, cube era kind of fails. If you think about like funneling all metrics uh, that you have into one big collector and then kind of graphing it, it's uh, a lot of traffic. Uh, and also there are not just many targets uh, that you have to monitor, but these targets dynamically change. So you have uh, releases that you roll daily or uh, even hourly or weekly. You have all these changes that happen in your monitoring infrastructure and those become your uh, unique instances that you still have to uh, uh, track and be able to address. And um, the uh, it's not really possible to have a query against your um, current state of the infrastructure with uh, without a uh, complex uh, dashboard or defined metric in the, in the um, in the traditional monitoring solutions that are there. So um, what Prometheus offers is to collect the metrics the way that we've discussed uh, Google does. So it exposes uh, any pretty much any service uh, metrics through something called exporter. And there are at least like 50 of them. You have them for different uh, types of web servers, for different, um, for different applications. Um, and then you're able to um, 
uh, use something called PromQL. So PromQL is the query language for those metrics. So you can easily create a um, top view for three uh, metrics against uh, some label, for example, and uh, that label would be uh, for a particular type of metric, like for HTTP requests in total and status uh, starting with 500. And then you do that um, uh, representation in five minutes. So you send all this, you define this uh, queries and uh, you can, you have client side libraries. So you literally can run an, uh, I, I, like a Jupyter notebook and connect to Prometheus server uh, and do the investigation and drill down using a client side libraries or their visualization uh, tools and also alert tools that come as part of the Prometheus server itself. So on the left hand side is the uh, Prometheus, service archi uh, Prometheus server architecture. You see the um, uh, you see the exporters that are getting pulled by a particular retrieval interval and then um, the, uh, they are written in the write ahead log so that uh, you, you basically have the ability if service crashes to restart what's been in flight before it got into the file system, you're able to recover to some level of granularity what happened in your uh, environment even if your Prometheus um, instance is restarted for example. And then it gets chunked into the SSD and uh, all, everything that is there in Prometheus is queryable with this PromQL quite developed uh, language. And also the alerts are getting pushed uh, into Alert man Manager. Uh, it's also possible to federate different Prometheus servers and uh, guys from Cloudflare, they will hopefully share the uh, really, really large Prometheus uh, infrastructure, really cool. Um, and still you can pull it with Grafana and, and do additional hooks in, um, into Prometheus using different clients. So storage architecture, um, is uh, with one thought in mind, so that monitoring system must be more reliable than the systems it's monitoring. So that why uh, that's that I th I think it's actually quite um, quite funny. I think it's an excuse right, really rather than a feature. But for now, uh, there is no uh, special Prometheus default way to store the metrics apart from just chunk them into the local file system. Yes, there are some um, threads about using the LVM beneath it or using a um, third-party connector and there are lots of, uh, not connectors, adapters, there are some adapters that allow you to write or only um, read or write and read into different type of uh, backend systems for long-term storage but for now it's all about like a local system um, and it's quite fast. The needed disk space is uh, literally a retention time by how many samples you're going to collect per second and uh, about two bytes per uh, sample. There's a very interesting uh, talk uh, that was on PromCom in earlier on this year about the way that they uh, figured the compression and uh, it's really efficient so if you think about a particular timestamp plus uh, the uh, uh, sample of that metric uh, it should have occupied two times uh, eight sixteen bytes but they actually keep it in two bytes so they are um, they're quite good at that and uh, I just want to wrap up with what Prometheus is not. Um, it's not 100% accurate. They basically claim it as a, a, a tool that allows you to do the um, operations on a large scale and understand like what's happening in your environment right now with very convenient way to query it, but it's not 100% accurate. If you really need some accuracy, for example, to cross charge or to bill someone, uh, then you need a different level of uh, storage, different ne level of reliability and um, uh, there are different solutions for that. Uh, it doesn't do any logging, so it only collects metrics. Um, it is also uh, not anything like anomaly detection, so it can provide you with alerts if some metrics go wrong, but there is no additional logic. You, if you want, you'll need to develop anything on top, of, um, on top of Prometheus yourself. And definitely, it's not a dashboarding solution, so still you need to have like a standalone um, solution to chart, to plot, and to be able to leverage um, um, Prometheus. And the idea is to have one Prometheus server in each failure domain so that if that domain uh, is gone by the definition of your availability, you basically are accepting the fact that it's gone through some external monitoring. That Prometheus server is gone, so for you the whole domain is gone. And within that domain, you keep the, uh, um, uh, you, you keep the instance, if everything works well, you keep the instances monitored by a designated um, uh, Prometheus that sends the metrics up into the federated uh, and uh, multi-tier uh, architecture. Well, that's, uh, that's about it. That's just a brief intro before you guys see the really exciting things that Cloudflare uh, colleagues are bringing to the table. So any questions? Yes, please. So 
going back to the SLIs and SLOs and SLAs, which which team in the kind of Google world uh, is responsible for coming up with all of these? Uh, it's, uh, I guess, a, a teamwork in between the product team and uh, the operation. So I'm not sure how the change control just generally works in Google, but I guess they do have like some pre-production meetings before a particular application goes live. So on the commissioning, uh, it's the uh, right time from my, fr from my assumption to define like how it would uh, work, what it requires, because some of the uh, applications, they need uh, like N plus one reliability in terms of the, uh, like the regions or uh, sl slots of the infrastructure that they run. Some of the, uh, um, some of the applications, they need um, some global low latency, but they can, um, they can go down in a, particular, uh, in a particular way, in a particular manner. So that is all negotiated before going live. And then uh, the definition of um, SLO is uh, then kept as the agreement in between. This is basically the, the tightest most metric if you think about it, right? So the definition of SLO is like, um, we will not allow this service to go down more than this amount of minutes a month or like a, a week. And then within that budget, we will try to experiment or examples would be like, we will actually agree that even if your service keeps up more than it's agreed, uh, SLO, we will um, send a chaos monkey and shoot it down, for example, so that you are not relying, you're not, uh, you're not exposing your system's availability that naturally becomes more than it's defined SLO. So they restart the servers, um, they restart the instances just because some people may think that it's a higher SLO. Okay, well, time for the cool demo. Sure. <laughs>